Hello, everyone. I'm Nick Desai. I'm the founder of a company here in Southern California called Heal. You may have heard of us, heal.com. We do doctor house calls and telehealth for primary care. Um, I'm a UCLA alumni, alumni from the School of Engineering before it was the Sam Welly School of Engineering uh, back in 1992. Uh, and I'm really excited to host a panel about uh, how close we are to the bionic brain. And uh, we have three incredible scientists with us today. Uh, Dr. Dehan Markovic from the School of uh, Engineering, Dr. Uh, Nantia Sutana from uh, the Department of Neurosurgery and uh, from the School of Medicine, and Dr. Nader Paradian from the Department of Neurosurgery, also at the School, uh, Geffen School of Medicine. Um, so without further delay, I wanna quickly get the panelists uh, introduced. Uh, let them make their opening remarks um, and then introduce themselves and their topics, and then we will get into a lively discussion. Uh, Dr. Markovic, if you can get us started off, that would be phenomenal. Uh, sure. Uh, do we have a slide share? Or, uh... There we go. Great. So I'm Dan Markovic. Um, I'm faculty at uh, UCLA Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. And I build neurotechnology to help address brain disease, such as depression and anxiety, chronic pain, Alzheimer's disease. These are enormous and growing unmet needs in medicine today. The economic burden in the US exceeds a trillion per year to manage these uh, problems. And many patients, if you look into this journey, have spent years trying one medication after another with no relief. And there are many times where clinicians have nothing left to offer. And one of the most promising approaches to addressing this is to use implantable medical devices for deep brain stimulation or DBS, which so far has shown to work in Parkinson's disease and movement disorders and has very limited success in epilepsy. If you go to the next slide. Uh, believe it or not, today's DBS devices use the same technology of cardiac pacemakers from three decades ago. You can see the chest-based device uh, that is used in Parkinson's disease that's implanted in about 10,000 patients per year worldwide. And you can see the head-based device for epilepsy that's implanted in only 300 patients per year. And both of these devices use uh, deep brain probes with only four to eight uh, electrode contacts, which gives you continent level access of the brain. These outdated devices focus on single targets and have no way of adjusting stimulation dosing without going to see a doctor uh, every couple of months. And the problem here is that uh, clinical success in Parkinson's disease does not translate to other indications because of major limitations in existing implantable medical devices. There is very limited technology that leads to limited therapy and limited adoption. We need devices um, that can access and manipulate brain networks to stimulate multiple brain regions and use recordings to intelligently self-adjust and optimize therapy and minimize side effects. Simply to say, we need tools that are at the right scale. The success in treating of Parkinson's disease and uh, cochlear implant are good because the tools are at the right scale, but for everything else, uh, we lack technology. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, accessing uh, deep brain networks is possible today in uh, clinical epilepsy monitoring. And the DARPA invested uh, $33 million in our team at UCLA and UCSF to develop research technology capable of interacting with functional brain networks. And here you see in the top left, a trial device that is based on that technology. We've been using this external trial device in human subject experiments at UCLA under IRB. And the device is meant to replace bulky and expensive clinical equipment that you see on the right while providing higher fidelity neuromodulation. And these recordings from a human patient show concordance with that clinical neoencoding system that is much larger and more expensive than our system. We are doing stimulations and uh, recordings to build real world evidence and data platform for future FDA submission. And we envision 
uh, medical device as a service uh, approach that combines modern brain computer interfaces and data analytics for brain network modulation to address these major medical and social needs. So I look forward to the discussion tonight and uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Markovic. Uh, certainly some eye-opening. I sat up myself in, in looking at some of this data and, and the advances that can be made in sort of the primitive state that we're in. Um, we'll go next to Dr. Nantia Suthana. Um, she will uh, talk about some of her work in this space as well. Hi everyone, good evening. So I'm an assistant professor at UCLA. I have a lab there really working in collaboration with Dan Markovich and others uh, to understand the mechanisms in the human brain that uh, support everyday functions such as memory, emotion, but also what, what happens when these systems are malfunctioning in disorders, neurological disorders and psychiatric disorders. And I work with uh, individuals who have an already implanted electrode uh, system in their, in their brain for epilepsy, for treating epilepsy. And here's an example patient here. I could start the video showing them in our lab. Uh, they have a system implanted deep in the brain, hippocampus, an area important for memory. And we're monitoring their movements with these motion trackers that are on body and uh, using those ceiling mounted, cam ceiling mounted cameras that you see. The individuals can also wear scalp EEG headsets and VR and AR headsets, eye tracking, uh, biometrics uh, to record heart rate and other uh, physiological measurements. And while we gather this data, we can answer questions about you know, basic human behavior in a more naturalistic setting, which is relevant for also translating into the real world where uh, you know, a lot of times these therapies you know, uh, falter given that they've been tested in the lab. Uh, so we're, we're studying memory with real relevance to Alzheimer's disease and other disorders that have uh, impairments in memory, such as traumatic brain injury and epilepsy. We're also working with uh, patients who have post-traumatic stress disorder, where the memory impairment is uh, not an issue of, you know, forgetting, but unwanted remembering in cases where you see illustrated here, uh, a trigger such as fireworks in veterans whom we work with can trigger, you know, a traumatic memory from their time in, uh, in battle. And so this, this, uh, unwanted reminder, it can be very debilitating. And for patients who don't respond to uh, traditional methods of treatment, we have a clinical trial to implant an FDA approved system for treatment of their seizures and using a signal that we identify to trigger that treatment. So that is an ongoing uh, clinical trial that's open for recruitment. And the next slide, I'll show you how we're working with engineering, uh, Dan Markovich, to test out the bedside device that will eventually be implanted. So the goal is, you know, right now we're working with systems that are uh, technologically out, you know, sort of old and not up to date, but we can understand these. Um, I think there's a video at the bottom there. I don't know if you wanna play. This is one of our patients with an implanted system walking around and you can see, I guess the video doesn't play, does it play? Okay. But you could see on the bottom right that the eyes are being tracked, motion is being tracked while the data is being recorded. And the goal is eventually to move into using these more high fidelity um, miniaturized wireless systems to gather signals such as from the single neurons and do programmatic stimulation. So I have here on the top right, some actual single neuron waveforms that were, were recorded with this system in uh, individuals who are you know, walking around in their hospital stay in the epilepsy monitoring unit. And uh, on the bottom left, you can see example stimulation pulses that are sent through these systems as well. So we're making quite a bit of progress, you know, with Dan, Dr. Mar Markovich to improve upon these technologies such that eventually we can uh, improve upon the neuroscience and the basic science knowledge that we have to inform therapies. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sutana. It's, it's obvious that you can do incredible things in the brain and we still can't get Zoom to play a video. So, you know, <laughs> the trade-offs of modern science, right? Right. Um, and last, but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Paradian, if you could give a uh, intro to yourself and your work, then we can get into a Q&A. Sure, I'm uh, Nader 
Paradian. I'm a, a professor of neurosurgery, uh, and my uh, day job is as a clinician. So I am in, uh, stereotyping a functional neurosurgeon as part of that. Um, I implant uh, devices in people's brains, like you heard about uh, from Dr. Markovich, uh, for primarily for Parkinson's disease and essential tremors, so movement disorders. Those are deep brain stimulators. But I also participate in um, clinical trials uh, with existing technologies to try and treat a spectrum of uh, diseases that we currently don't have FDA approval. So we heard a lot about um, the new technologies that we need to develop. Um, I wanna paint a little bit of a rosier picture that we can still treat a lot of uh, diseases. We definitely need new devices. We need to understand the physiology. We need to do the neuroscience uh, like uh, Dr. Susanna uh, is doing and, and many others are doing. Uh, but we have uh, a lot of capabilities to do things now. So uh, just to give you an idea, we have uh, clinical trials uh, of brain stimulation for uh, depression. We have clinical trials of a special device uh, that was designed in collaboration with industry to uh, provide uh, artificial vision for people who are blind. Um, I, we have a clinical trial um, in collaboration with uh, one of my partners here at UCLA, Dr. Osaf Bari, uh, to use deep brain stimulation for uh, chronic pain. Um, collaborations looking at how the brain uh, controls the heart and how signals from the heart go to the brain. So looking at diseases that we don't traditionally think about as neurological or psychiatric diseases and how the brain and spinal cord might play into that. Um, and finally, you know, we have trials where we're placing electrodes chronically in people who are spinal cord injury patients, people who are quadriplegics um, in a collaboration that we have with uh, uh, Richard Anderson at Caltech uh, in a brain computer interface trial to uh, see how people who um, have spinal cord injuries can directly control a computer, a cursor uh, on the screen and um, add functionality that they may have lost to their injury. So, um, I think there's a lot that we need to do, but there's a lot that we can actively do right now. We do need better devices, uh, which is why we're here to talk about this. Uh, we do need better, uh, more neuroscience, uh, but there's a lot of uh, exciting things that we're doing uh, here and now. Great, uh, thank you, Dr. Brody. And um, look, uh, first of all, just to the audience, if you wanna ask questions, please put them in the Q and A. What I will try to do is pick the common themes, read them out loud, and get them answered from our, our panel of experts. Um, I'll start out with a few questions that did, that did come in before, right? Which is, the, the first question is, obviously one of the recurring themes of, that you all three talked about is the ability to help people with chronic pain, Alzheimer, everything from Alzheimer's to chronic pain to depression, these different dimensions of disease. How, with the exception of the very early systems that Dr. Markovich talked about, how close are we to your innovations actually helping in a hospital, in a bedside setting for real patients at any scale? Dan, why don't you Dan, go? Can sure. I answer that? One yeah, I can take a shot to that. So we, obviously this is a long journey and there are many uh, steps uh, we need to take in order to safely roll this out to uh, the real world. Uh, so the first step in uh, the, on that journey is to uh, use a trial device, which is uh, attaching uh, electronics uh, with the capability for advanced uh, sensing and stimulation and closed loop to uh, existing implantable electrode arrays for a short period of time. And we are using this kind of a really uh, excellent opportunity of uh, epilepsy monitoring where patients spend two to three weeks uh, in hospital to have, um, uh, to track the location of their seizure for, for uh, resective surgery or um, alternative uh, intervention. And so that's kind of the first step to demonstrate that this technology does its intended functionality. And then uh, beyond that, um, we will have to really um, uh, commit a significant amount of uh, resources to make this technology uh, into an implantable device uh, that uh, requires um, 
qualification units and uh, significant investment to do a multi-stage clinical trial uh, before we can go to uh, pre-market approval. So the overall journey from zero to pre-market approval is, you know, depending on how efficiently it's executed, but it's on the order of, you know, seven to 10 years, I would say. So we are quite far away, but it's not because of the technology, the lack of uh, uh, technology demonstrations. It's really the lack of that kind of a funding and the opportunity to carry this over to the next step. This is uh, research and development technology, and uh, there is a quite a bit uh, that's uh, necessary to get the product level of maturity. And since we are a university, uh, we certainly appreciate um, the opportunity to do this early R&D, but we do also have appetite and experience in technology transition with the right-minded uh, uh, investment, uh, we will uh, gladly jump, jump on the opportunity to do this right. Great. And, and one of the other questions at the very other end of the spectrum is when people, when the average person, including me, sees a topic like the bionic brain, right? Yeah, surely there's part of us that thinks about people with disease, but then we also think about, you know, augmented capabilities and and superhuman and the $6 million man, if you're old enough to remember that TV show and, you know, true bionics. Is the work you're doing specific for helping people with disease or will it also be leveraged for augmented capabilities or enhancing someone with their full faculties? Yeah, I would say from technology point of view, just to quickly uh, kind of uh, tackle that and then uh, Nader can speak a lot more from the um, clinical perspective and Antia as well uh, from translational that uh, in, in my view, everything starts and ends in a clinic, meaning that we first need to really address big medical needs in order to establish credibility and really ethically justify uh, implantation of technology in the human body. And once we get there and we're really reaching uh, uh, desirable outcomes in the clinical world, then of course we can really learn more about the brain and provide various kinds of assistive uh, options uh, that would benefit uh, uh, users. So I, I can make a, a couple comments about it. I, I think uh, the focus of all of our work uh, is right now to help people who have some form of disease and loss of function in life. Um, and I don't mean loss of function like weakness, uh, but it's, it's loss of the ability to participate in everyday life, whether it be from Parkinson's disease or epilepsy or uh, dementia. But it's very easy to think about how these devices could be extended to uh, enhancing function. And we don't have to go very far to think about it because that's what happened in the world of cosmetic surgeries, right? Plastic surgery was not um, always about, um, or is not only about uh, cosmetics. Um, it's to help people who may have had injuries of other sorts. And, uh, and then there's cosmetic surgery, which is meant to enhance. And there has been talk about, you know, what is the role of cosmetic neurosurgery? And I, I think we'll have to face that uh, but in our field, you know, there is a lot of work in, in ethics uh, to try and uh, think about that actively and make sure that it doesn't get uh, abused. Uh, but uh, enhancement is, is hopefully in the future, a distant future, not in the near future. Cool. And, and of the audience questions so far, there's a common theme in the first several questions, right? Which is one ask, one, they all basically hover around this question is, what are the limitations of the systems you're building and what is the limitation in improving them? Is it things like battery life or scar tissue or how long the system can last before you have to replace it? Or is it the size? Do we need to improve our understanding of the science of the brain or the engineering and just make smaller circuitry or surgical techniques? Where, where is the li limiting reagents to big leaps forward? All of the above. <laughs> I think not the amount that at the same time as I said it. Uh, it, it really is uh, all of those things. And um, it's a great question because it really gets to, you know, 
why the three of us are here and speaking, which is that it's a multidisciplinary field. So I, as a neurosurgeon, I'm also a neuroscientist, but I, as a neurosurgeon, can't uh, advance the field by myself. I need neuroscientists like Nantia who help us understand the brain and how it functions. But I also need engineers like Dan who can help design the devices. But we also need bioengineers who can look at the, the tissue interface and thinking about the scar. We need people who specialize in powering these devices, whether it's externally powered or internally powered, or Dan, I'm sure will want to comment on, you know, harnessing internal uh, energies and powering devices that way. Um, the, it's a hugely multidisciplinary field. Um, and, uh, you know, part of the question really is, do we need a single device that can do everything or do we design purpose-built devices? And there's two different strategies about that. And I, you know, Dan's device is uh, somewhat, it, not somewhat, it's very flexible and it can have many applications. Whereas for example, the clinical trial that I have uh, for uh, brain stimulation for blindness is really purpose-built. It could be adapted for other uses, but we, you know, as we designed that, we really thought about, well, what is it that we have to do to be able to do what we want to do for people who are blind? And so there, there's different strategies, but it takes a team and not just one person. Great. And so, so let me just ask, for example, to you, Dr. Suthana, when you work with Dr. Markovic, and I, I'm not, you know, obviously you're working very closely together, but, in, and this is also a follow-up question from the, from the audience is that, is it, is your understanding of the neuroscience of the brain waiting on his ability of circuitry or is his ability of circuitry and, you know, you know, small, waiting on your understanding of, of the core neuroscience? Um, to, I think it's, it's neither, well, both are waiting for each other, but in, in, in a way that it can be done in parallel. I think if we waited on either, in either direction, we would lose out on great, great opportunities. So um, we really work in parallel. So, you know, for example, with the devices that are already existing, there are many discoveries that we've made and things that we can make with those. But yes, with, with the new devices, we can make much more. So it's sort of, you know, I think it, it requires constant communication and collaboration between the two sides, you know, engineering part, you know, development, but also the neuroscience to kind of make sure we're, you know, all going in the, in the direction together as a team and inform each other if there are things that we learn uh, while we're going forward. If, we, if I learn something on the neuroscience side that could prioritize certain develop on the development on the engineering side, you know, that's something I'll, tell, I'll talk to the engineers about mm -hmm. on a, you know, sort of day-to-day -day basis. We, we are very close when we work together. So, in fact, we share a student together that we co-mentor that works on a lot of these issues. Yeah. And are there parts of the brain, I, Dr. Markovic had shown a thing where different pain and different symptoms happen in the brain. Are there parts of the brain, occipital lobe or motor cortex or prefrontal or whatever? I'm, I've said everything I know about the brain in that question, by the way, but um, are there parts of the brain that we understand better or worse? Or is it, we're looking at all these different areas. Is there an area that might be easier to figure out or harder? Who wants to take that one? It's such, a, it's such an interesting question because there are parts of the brain that we think we understand more, but as our technologies improve and we're able to study the brain with greater precision, we realize that there's so much more that we don't know. Uh, so if you look at like the frontal lobes, you know, we're, we're really involved in uh, emotion and, and psychiatric disease and, and other, we, we, there's a lot we don't know about that area. Um, and we feel like we know a lot more about the motor systems, like how the brain controls movement, but it turns out we still don't know a lot about that area also. So there are relative scales, but I would, uh, I guess the answer is there's a whole lot more that we don't know than we know. And the technologies are helping us discover uh, that uh, black box that we, we haven't quite gotten into. And there's also one other difference too, is that some of the behaviors, let's say sensory motor behaviors, are more easily replicated in the lab or simulated in the lab versus, you know, emotion and memory and these things are harder to simulate in the lab, which is why my lab and others are pushing to try to understand the brain in more naturalistic right. behaviors, such that when we get these therapies, they're actually going to work in the person as they're living their life. And so, you know, with these deep learning, machine learning methods, 
Um, we could start to look at very complex data during natural naturalistic behavior that we couldn't even tease apart, you know, years ago. And now we could start to look at them and, and try to f find out relationships with the neural neural activity. And, and to add to that, I guess uh, the other aspect is there are areas that are e easier to access, uh, but, you know, then there are also certain properties that are very complex and difficult to understand, like in the sensory motor area, which is uh, relatively um, uh, easy to access uh, and brain networks are topographic, meaning that uh, neurons in the vicinity uh, do similar things and assist coordinate in, 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 in the same outcome. Whereas some of the more difficult to access areas like the work that Nantia is doing in memory are non-topographic. And although, you know, it's first of all difficult to access. And second, once you get there, you realize things are very, very kind of complex and, and sparse. And so from, from that point of view, I think the accessibility to those functionally relevant areas and the ability to understand what's in there, first of all, before we can then translate that to do some kind of a useful uh, intervention is, is, is really the uh, you know, very, very interesting and complex uh, uh, challenge. And, and similarly, looking at, are the, you know, I, I speak from literally personal experience. A week ago, my father-in-law had uh, neurosurgery at spinal surgery at UCLA to, to fuse his discs with a colleague of Dr. Brady and Dr. Daniel Liu, right? Um, and, and that kind of pain, pinched nerve, herniated disc in the back, it's been around forever. 50 years ago, people had it, people have it now, right? And the, the methods are advanced, but they're, they're relatively similar. Whereas diseases like Alzheimer's, more people, people are living longer, we're seeing more people with them. Are there diseases that are better understood? And if so, does that help create these kinds of therapeutics? As in, because we understand the disease or the pain better, we can solve it quicker or are those two things not related? I'll let you go first. <laughs> So um, again, these are really uh, great questions because um, medicine makes progress sort of in two different ways. One is by luck uh, when we don't really understand the mechanisms or we do something out of convenience. Um, and uh, in other ways, uh, in other cases, we move forward because we have uh, you know, a good understanding about um, how the brain or the body works, and then we develop an intervention to get in there. So, you know, some of the most common medications, you know, aspirin, we didn't really know how it worked until um, after it was used for a long time. Um, but getting it back to what we do, brain stimulation. So the brain stimulation that we use for Parkinson's disease was based on a very sound theory about how the brain is connected and where we should put electrodes in order to treat Parkinson's disease. And it led to a very effective therapy. But at the same time, you know, we have other therapies where, um, you know, so non-invasive stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation uh, that's used for depression, you know, that was, a lot of work was done to show that it was effective before we really understood much about how it works. And we still have a lot more to do to understand how it works. So these fields have to sort of move forward in parallel. Uh, but the one warning I will give is, um, you know, probably about a decade ago, we, we went through a period in our field where, you know, <clears throat> uh, a well-known neurosurgeon, uh, at least amongst neurosurgeons, said there's no part of the brain that's safe from a neurosurgeon. Um, and uh, <laughs> it was true. And so we had all these trials where you know, everyone would say, I'm going to put an electrode here, I'm going to put an electrode there. And, you know, a lot of people were implanted with a lot of devices, and we didn't learn a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And so we've put the brakes on that sort of as a field, not literally, but uh, we pulled back and said, let's be a little bit more methodical. Let's study these patients that we implant. Let's learn something from everyone that we implant so that, you know, we're trying to help people while we're trying to learn and advance the field. So I think we've seen a, a, a really important pivot uh, that is making a, a huge impact and moving us forward in the right direction. Interesting. Is there... Um, one of the questions that, that one of the audience members asked, and, and I think comes to mind whenever we talk about this is, there's work to understand the actual human brain and to put electrodes in it and to give people relief from pain and all that. 
And then there's this other field over here that everyone talks deep learning, machine learning, AI, right? Is that, is the work there of value to the work you do and vice versa? I don't know, Dan, we have a student shared between us who is working on this, Urish Topalovich. And yeah, it's it's very much integral. I wouldn't consider it outside of it at all. I, I uh, think that it all needs to come together in order to make our goals happen. So uh, they're very useful in, you know, the brain is complex. The signals we're recording is complex. We need those tools to parse through them in order to tell, help inform us about when is best to to deliver treatment. Uh, and so, you know, we really need to imp incorporate both at the same time. I'll say anything. I would say that uh, there is a lot of interesting um, parallels and inspirations uh, between technology and biology. But one thing that we really need to be cautioned is that technology and biology have fundamentally different operating principles. Mm -hmm. And just to illustrate that, you know, I like to use the analogy that in transportation that we didn't build um, airplanes by mimicking the flapping of the wings of the birds, although people did try to build airplanes like that in the early, early days, but technology solved the problem in a way that technology does. Mm -hmm. and, and the fundamental difference between the computer mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the uh, brain is that brain is really, the, the root of human intelligence is the memory and our ability to predict uh, future events based on the patterns and the past experience where the computer just does the mindless execution of the list of instructions. And so I think, you know, we need to kind of step back and really rethink how, um, and the brain also because of the memory the, and, the, and this whole the prediction has 10 times more, tenfold more uh, feedback paths than the feed forward paths, which is why mm -hmm. training of neural networks is very difficult. Mm -hmm. However, the, the concepts of adaptive signal processing and learning are definitely useful in many applications since we, we see even like useful technologies like natural language processing and virtual assistants and many other examples which mm -hmm. can have a specialized uh, learning based type of approaches that I think we can benefit and certainly that applies also to brain data analytics. Fascinating. And you know, the first one of these sessions that I, I did uh, was on neural prosthetics. And there was a hand surgeon, a very famous UCLA hand surgeon, whose name I don't remember now, but he- Dr. Azari. Yes, Dr. Azari, yes, yes, thank you. Um, and he said something that was related to a question I just got from the audience, which is, he said that we always try to build systems that connect as close to the affected area, as in, if it's for the hand, we try to work with the periphery nervous system in the hand rather than in the brain as close because we can get more fidelity there. Is that true of your work? As in, is deep brain stimulation for, is the right way to address these issues or can it be done at the periphery if you have back pain or arm pain or whatever, can it be done at the periphery? So I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, there are multiple highways into the nervous system. And there's, you know, there's highways that flow in, there's highways that flow out. The advantage of going more peripheral in the nervous system, so out to the nerves, is that you're letting the brain do what it needs to do. So for someone who's an amputee, you know, controlling the hand, well, you know, the signal comes from the brain, then it goes to the spinal cord, it gets some processing of spinal cord, then it goes out to the nerves. If you can go out to the nerves, then you let the brain, which is much smarter than us, do everything that it needs to do and decode the signal. You've got a, a really high signal to noise ratio and, and you can do what you need to do. But there are some diseases where the, the, the disease is actually in the brain. And so if you go out to the periphery, you may not be getting an effective signal. It's a, it's a garbled signal to begin with. So, um, I guess the, there's two answers to your question. One is it depends on the disease. It depends on what's going on. And it depends on where you can get good signals. But we can work with any signal, it, it turns out, if we do enough analyses, if we use enough computational neuroscience to decode it and understand how the intention or the behavior relates uh, to the uh, brain signals. Interesting. And Dr. 
Sutana, I'll ask you this one from the audience, uh, in part because from our last session, you were very quotable and, and in part because you're being uncharacteristically quiet today. So um, uh, I would love the tweet that gets out there that gets people, you know, it goes live in the Twitter sphere, which is, what do you think of Neuralink? Is there stuff a bunch of who here? Is it ever going to work? Oh, great. Thanks for that. <laughs> no, but, um, you know, it, it, it's, there's a lot of positives about this, uh, you know, the hype around Neuralink. And I'd say the positives are that, you know, people are paying attention to this, this, field and getting excited about it to put resources into it, which that's what really is needed to get it done. I'd say, you know, on the techno technology side, and Dan can say more about that, in terms of uh, what they're trying to do, there's a lot of promise to it in, in terms of moving the field forward and the neuroscience behind it. I, I'd say their goals are a different thing, sort of in terms of their over sort of arching goals of, you know, merging our brains with a computer and so on and so forth, you know, may not be necessarily realistic, but um, from the technology side, you know, there's definitely some promising work there that I, I look forward to seeing. Dan, what do you think? Uh, yes, I uh, agree that uh, technology has, uh, I would say more of the science appeal, uh, the way that it's positioned to really get to access uh, with a higher density uh, more neurons at a given time and so on. And I think there is uh, great progress in the uh, interface technology, the electrode arrays. And while I have a chance now to say at that interface, brain computer, brain machine interface, I would like to honor the legacy of UCLA. That is the founding place for brain computer interface. Our computer science department uh, 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 coined the term Professor Vidal in 1973 um, that uh, brain computer interface um, defined that uh, ter term and demonstrated two dimensional navigation of a cursor in a two dimensional on the computer space uh, based on the activity of uh, motor neurons, basically. And so I think if you look into that, uh, the, that whole framework is a very significant um, uh, in 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 uh, event that is even replicated today to a large degree, and so I think Neuralink is really kind of more in that territory with with their technology, and uh, there is a uh, quite a bit of work to to translate that uh, into into therapeutic technology because when you talk about therapeutic stimulation is mandatory. You just don't open brain to record and have fun, but. There is a lot of um, uh, development required to get into the therapeutic space and be able to modulate networks and be therapeutically efficacious. Interesting. And, and there's some really great questions coming in from the audience now. Thank you, audience, um, for these great questions. So one is, when and, and I'll expand on a question that somebody asked. One is, when you create, let's say you could create a device and it worked and it solved the X, Y, Z issue, right? And well, let's say it's chronic pain or, or uh, anxiety or depression or whatever these things, is it eliminating? Uh, this is the question, uh, Dr. Sutana, you said you would answer live. Is it eliminating it or is it the tricking the brain into thinking, is it curing it or is it tricking the brain into thinking, well, you don't actually feel pain anymore or you don't actually feel fear anymore, or anxiety anymore. What are we actually, what are these devices doing? Ooh, that's a, that's a harder question than I thought it would be. It's weird. <laughs> it's weird. I can't see the, the Q and A and like last time. So I might've been clicking on things without knowing what they're asking, but I'm going to stop trying to figure out what's going on there, but that's probably why I'm quiet. Well, so good. I'm I you for that. Okay. Question. So, I mean, but that is a relevant uh, question re regarding fear because we are doing a clinical trial to use a device to do closed loop stimulation where we can where we will try to detect when this uh, you know trigger is is happening to elicit fear that is unwanted and 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 un, um, you know in a situation that is safe and so you know we are we have had two patients implanted so far that have shown great improvement with a continuous stimulator now we're going into you know looking at closed loop stimulation so you know, there's, there's some evidence to suggest that this, this can be effective in 
I don't know if I would say eliminating the fear because we still need to understand how it's working, but at least, you know, minimizing the detrimental impact that it has on the patient where they may completely dissociate and freeze and, you know, not be functional in their daily life versus let's say the trigger goes off and they can continue to interact with others. They can continue to be present and, you know, function, I, uh, whether that percent, whether the experience is, is, the, you know, completely eliminated or not. I mean, we still, we still are, don't know much about how that's working, but um, yeah, there's some promising results going on right now, su suggesting that we can, it can be effective in fear, anxiety, uh, hate. I don't know about yet. We're not <laughs> testing that, but <laughs> Um, and although if you fear and anxiety are what drive hate, right? Yeah. So maybe solving one will solve the other. Uh, Dr. Brady, and I, I think you marked that you were going to answer this question, but do these devices that we're talking about in this conversation become single patient solutions or are they, is, are they repeatable, right? When we have a therapeutic, you know, today's most popular one that we're all talking about, is a COVID vaccine, which works for most people or all people or, or, or pills that work for millions of people. Do these devices get so custom that they're, this one's for Bob and this one's for, for Beth, or are they broadly applicable? So the devices themselves are hopefully broadly applicable. Uh, the current devices we have, for example, to treat movement disorders are, you know, we use the same one in everyone. But the new technologies, like the ones that Dr. Markovich are describing, while it's the same hardware, it's the, it's the signals that make it customizable. It's, this, it's the ability to actually listen to the brain and hear what's going on in the brain that is specific to each individual patient and allows the device to respond to those signals to identify when you know, maybe someone's more depressed or maybe when someone's having a seizure or when some disease is going on that is very patient specific. Uh, that, that's what makes it customizable and that's hopefully what we think will make these therapies even more effective. So it's building on what Dr. Suthana just described. So we have a generalized platform that is then custom customizable and can uh, learn and adapt to the individual um, patient. There's one other question that, that's sort of related to this, and it's an interesting one. If I can comment on it, is you know, does it matter how much? How does the brain treat these devices? You know, from a physiological standpoint, it's a really interesting question um, because you know, if, if you think about how we use a, a hammer, you know, when you hold a hammer, it turns out your brain almost internalizes that hammer, it becomes a, an extension of your body. Um, and when we use these devices, you know, we're, we're very fixated when we start on, you know, restoring normal brain function, but the brain's much smarter than we are. And sometimes all you need to do is give the brain a helping hand and it will learn how to use those devices in a way that's meaningful to the person, to the patient, to their experience, to their life. Um, and it may not be life as we know it, but it can still provide a significant benefit and improvement for someone. So um, we, did, we can't just think about how we can change the brain, but we also need to think about how the brain interacts with the device once it starts uh, interact, once it starts stimulating it. So it's a fascinating area. And, and I have a, that, that's a, just on that point, I have a related question that I think is for you or for Dr. Suthana. Um, and I'll, I'll take my own experience. I, I had a micro discectomy when I was 43. I'm uh, sadly, I'm 51 now. It's, um, but, and after that surgery, my pain mostly went away, but then it came back and my wife, who's a physician said, what doctors say to patients all the time, get outside, do some exercise, do physical therapy. And, and it really helped. And I thought there's no way this can work the same way a surgery can or a pill can, but guess what it does, right? And that ties to a question about non-invasive techniques, right? Is doctors are more and more understanding everyone should be mobile, no matter where, what your pain level is, be more active, be more mobile, get more fresh air, see more green, look at the ocean for all the many of these issues, right? Are those things, things that you look at as part of an overall patient improvement or are you focused strictly on the electronics and chemistry where you can affect 
uh, treatment, and those are parts of the, the broader medical wellness domain that you don't look at. I'll take a quick stab at that um, because it's something that has been a, a sort of, a, I guess, a breakthrough in my own thinking. And I, I think you're absolutely right. It, it's these devices are not necessarily therapeutic in and of themselves. Uh, so, um, you know, you know someone has high blood pressure, the doctor doesn't just give a medicine and say, you know, that's it, but they tell you to go exercise. Same thing, you know, this is the experience I got from our clinical trial for uh, blindness. We realize, you know, we don't, we're not just trying to give people some kind of vision back, but we need to have them go live with this device. They need to experience it. They need to have visual rehabilitation, learn how to use it and learn how to um, adapt their life to this new implant that they've had. And so um, I'm a very strong believer that all of these therapies do not stand alone. They're part of, again, this theme of multidisciplinary uh, care. So we have the multidisciplinary team that's creating the devices, but then we have you know, the neurosurgeons who put it in, the neurologists who help manage it, the psychiatrists who help manage it, the rehabilitation doctors who get people out there. It's, it's really, it's not a standalone device. Um, it's, it, that care is really critical. So, and, and so it's like the rest of healthcare really, where everything has to work to work together, right? You need the physical therapist and the mental health person and the prime, all these things working together, which is, which is what I, which is really interesting and, and, and reassuring in some ways. I'm gonna ask a very specific question a, a, a audience member asked, um, which is can, can the solutions you're working on help a child who has suffered a left MCA stroke I don't actually know what MCA stands for in this case, but you probably do. And the related issues such as seizures and language processing delays, visual processing. Can this help, you know, we all wanna help children more than anything. Can this be useful for a child or are we farther away from, further away from that than we'd like to be? So for better or worse, I think a lot of the technologies that we are focusing on now, um, are developing these technologies for groups, for, for larger groups, more what we'd call homogenous groups. So for example, again, people with Parkinson's disease or people with blindness, when we start getting into more specific groups like uh, a, a child that has a, a left MCA stroke, which is a specific territory of the brain that's had a stroke, it, it's harder to develop a specific technology for that or interventions for that. Um, because there aren't that many people who have that specific condition. Now, it doesn't mean that devices can't eventually be used or adapted for uh, those applications. Um, and we're hopeful that, again, using a device like what Dan is uh, designing, that it is uh, all purpose enough that it can be adapted to those other applications. But I don't think right now we have uh, any active uh, clinical trials or specific applications. And, like and a follow-up question to that, Dr. Sutana, is our understanding of the brain better in adults or children, or does it not matter? Uh, you know, I mean, I think in this particular field, a lot of the work we're doing is in adults because of the additional risks, you know, of course, with surgery. But we do have a, a study working with pediatric epilepsy patients who do get electrodes implanted. And, you know, we've been discussing a potential clinical trial for adolescent related psychiatric disorders. So it's something that I think will come down the line uh, and follow the adult uh, trials, which are ob obviously more prevalent right now. So I, I wouldn't say it's, it, you know, it's not an area that we'll, we'll move into. I think that it will come, but, you know, we want to make sure that, of course, the safety and ethical considerations are well thought out there. Right. Um, so we're, look, we have about eight minutes left and I want to have time for wind up. I'm going to ask a couple of quick questions. Um, there are a bunch of audience ones. I'll try to wrap, run through them, but a couple quick ones to start off with. People are hearing this and people are asking, will this be available and recorded? And how can someone be a participant in a trial? And how do I get more involved? This is so cool. And how do people get involved? How do people connect with UCLA about this incredible work that, that all of you are doing? What is the best way? Give 20 seconds from each of you. 
Uh, for us, we have a website, uh, my lab website, suthanalab.com. We have a, a link to the PTSD clinical trial, MCI, also one for mild cognitive impairment using a non-invasive methodology. There was a question about non-invasive technologies, which I can make a comment if there's time. Uh, and also clinical trials. Oh, go ahead on that one. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, you know, for certain disorders, it may, they may be effective, these non-invasive therapies. In fact, it's approved, you know, for depression. Uh, but, you know, it's tough because those, those, those uh, interventions require a person to go and get treatment. It's not being carried with them constantly like a, in, an implanted electrode would. So the effectiveness it can wear off. They'd have to go get treatments again. And for disorders that are involving deep brain areas like fear, anxiety, memory, Alzheimer's related PTSD, those non-invasive methods cannot reach those deep brain areas. And so, you know, for those that uh, don't respond, you know, they may come to us for um, consideration of an implanted electrode where they can care that's with them continuously and will work basically moment to moment as they go forward, like in the case of epilepsy or PTSD, when you don't know when it can happen at any time that the seizure or the trigger, right? And you want it, you want your therapy to be ready to deal with it. So as far as the clinical trial for PTSD, it's open for recruitment. They can email me. My email's on the what on Google or on our website. And clinical trials. Um, I believe gov also has a list of all these clinical trials that are going on. Cool. And and Dr. Markovich or Dr. Bradian. Um, same here. Um, we have uh, our information mostly uh, available through um, internet, and I'm just going to type here my email uh, for everybody. Feel free to reach out. Um, we also have a lot of other related technologies, at least in my uh, group. I look into development of technologies that globally benefit society. I've got technologies in the technology domain and uh, consumer applications, and besides the uh, neurotech that is also associated technologies uh, for miniaturized uh, intravascular cardiac pacemakers and similar where a lot of these uh, miniaturization and advanced uh, wireless power and data techniques can really advance uh, uh, the quality of care and um, you know data analytics is there as well so a lot of techniques and I'm always happy to hear new ideas and engage with uh, those who are interested. So feel free to email with any questions or um, ideas. Uh, always appreciate that. Great, Dr. Perdian. I don't know if I have too much to add, but yeah, lab websites, clinicaltrials.gov, and UCLA also has a, a directory of all uh, active clinical trials that uh, people can uh, inquire right. about as well. Well, look, I, I'm going to make a comment to the audience uh, that I think is is really, really important. Um, this last week, we landed uh, the, the very, very famously the Perseverance rover on Mars, right, with this co complex thing in a planet 40 million miles away rotating. It's incredible, right? And yet the problem facing us right here at home is a silver tsunami, right? 50 million Americans will be living into their 90s is estimated the next couple of decades, right? People are getting older, they're living longer, Alzheimer's, dementia, anxiety, depression, chronic pain, these are real things and the cost is a trillion dollars now. Imagine what it will be. The other way to get involved is obviously money, right? The money is, uh, if you ask any of these scientists, I guarantee you they'll tell you money is what is holding them up more than anything else because Neuralink can make a lot of noise. And when you're one of the richest people in the world, you can do things in a university setting that's advancing basic science, there has to be funding sources. And I, I think that's another interesting way to, to get involved. Um, I will go for a last, um, I'm gonna ask one or two very quick audience questions because uh, Brian Kohler, and I wouldn't say an audience member, name out loud, but he actually works with me at Heal. So I'm gonna ask a very quick question he asked and then I'm gonna ask you each for a closing comment. Um, the brain learns how to use the devices. Does that mean if we were able to connect a device that can detect light outside the physical, visible spectrum that a person would be able to see ultraviolet or infrared light? Is that is that an example of what you mean? Yes, yes. So for example, the device that we use has a camera that sees right now it's set for visible light, 
but we've talked about whether the camera could use heat detection or could use ultraviolet light. So, um, and we've even heard from people who do stuff for the military, you know, could we use these devices in our soldiers to help them detect things on the battlefield? So yes, there are opportunities to give, I guess you can call superhuman powers uh, to uh, people. Great, okay. Closing comment, Dr. Markovic. Closing comment, I think this is a very exciting area that uh, I believe there is a tremendous opportunity given how outdated technology is in uh, medicine. We do everything we can to advance consumer applications and every year we have new toys and gadgets and surprisingly we do very little in comparison for healthcare. And so I think uh, we see, I see a great opportunity there. And like you mentioned, uh, there is a different uh, mechanism and a need for, for uh, developing and scaling this up. So I'm happy to uh, engage in those discussions. And overall, I think uh, it's a uh, you know, great place where we are. Uh, we can never get this soon enough considering how many people need it. Uh, so I hope that uh, there would be um, significant uh, interest and uh, um, you know, support uh, from the community at large to pursue these ideas. Great, uh, Dr. Paradian, uh, about 15, 20 seconds. I think it's a really exciting time. I wanna add one more thing. We haven't talked about safety. There's a huge emphasis on the safety of these products. And I think there's, um, you know, that's what keeps people away from them. But I want people to be reassured that just as much as we're excited about how much it can help, we're making sure that these devices are developed in a way that are safe and uh, that people will want to participate in these trials. And Great, these thank you. And Dr. Sutana? Oh, what can I add to that? I agree. Very exciting time. It's changing very fast. When I was in grad school, all of this work pretty much didn't exist. So everything we're doing is brand new. And I love that about the field. And also very exciting to see multiple fields kind of come together. So, you know, chemists, biologists, engineers, um, clinicians, all coming together uh, to make this happen. And it's very exciting. So thanks for ha having us. Well, it's a perfect segue to my last comment. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to Dr. Sathana Markovic and Paradian. Thank you to UCLA. Thank you to everyone who attended. I'll just say when I was in grad school, okay, which is long before Dr. Sathana, Dr. Samueli was a professor at UCLA that went and started a company called Broadcom and now the School of Engineering is named after him. Um, and David Geffen was a guy who liked to hang out with some musicians in this thing called rap that very few people had heard of back then. And today the School of Medicine is named after him. So each and every one of us, each and every person listening and at UCLA and a student, we all have a role to play and don't ever limit yourself by where you are now because look at where people can go when we put our heads together and work together. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending on behalf of UCLA and the scientists. Um, it's been a thrill to do all of these. And uh, good night, everybody.